welcome everyone. Uh, it's nice to see everyone together again. This will be the first, actually the second of our retreats. The, uh, we had a smaller retreat with program directors about a month ago. Uh, and we will have a second retreat in the Auburn office that's coming up in the first of uh, October. We switched it around a little bit this time from the, uh, the first retreat. And um, we started the last time we met with sort of the supervisory uh, training going first and then after lunch or during lunch uh, I did my piece on civility and we really felt as though we, we needed to switch that around. It was sort of one of the, um, uh, the believe that it, the, the tone should be set with talking about civility. Um, and so that's where we're going to begin. Uh, so this is sort of both an introduction as well as the beginning of the, uh, the civility and sort of the tenets of uh, responsible behavior and communication for the organization. Uh, when I began thinking about this training about a month ago, uh, I thought about sort of what, uh, what, are we, what are we trying to accomplish here? I mean, this is a, when we talk about civility and sort of uh, responsible behavior amongst people, it's been an issue for, you know, 5,000 years, you know, great philosophers we're talking about it, and, um, the heads of uh, religions have been talking about it on these sort of these large grand scales, and here we are 5,000 or more years later, and you know, Nanatuck's talking about it. And, uh, and what, can, what can we do as an organization that some of the great minds, uh, the great thinkers of, uh, of all time, uh, still haven't been able to sort of change the basic sort of tenets at, at, at times in behavior between people. I mean, we just you know, you pick up a newspaper and it's very um, disconcerting, it's very frustrating, it's very sad to see what we do to each other on a daily basis. Um, and um, so when I'm thinking about this, I'm trying to think, who am I to think that I can, one, to talk about civility and try to change people's behaviors? That who am I to think that I may be able to change somebody from being sort of uh, somebody that's not a very nice person to somebody who can be a nice person? Um, I'm not a philosopher, although um, I've had discussions with my kids who often walk away saying, "Who does he think he is, Plato?" Um, and, uh, and I'm certainly not um, sort of a, uh, somebody who talks about uh, my spiritualness very often. Um, but I am somebody that I believe is very optimistic. Uh, I think that um, that type of optimism is really has been important at Nanatuck. I think that from the first days of uh, even the creation of, of Nanatuck, when you know four family members decided that they wanted to move their kids out of a, an institution into a community home, it took great passion and optimism. Uh, to think that they could accomplish it. And they used that optimism, I believe, to really begin what was then the first sort of congregate living. And actually, there was almost a, you know, the type of place that their, uh, their sons and daughters lived in. It was, a, it was like a parental household where there was house parents for those kids. Uh, it was the first sort of a group home or group style of living for kids that happened to have a uh, disability in the state of Massachusetts, but it was born out of that optimism. And we could never have changed in the, the early 90s, moving from uh, 15 group homes and moving over 50 people into shared living situations without some sort of wild optimism that could happen. And if it didn't have, if the organization didn't sort of have that positive and optimistic bent and thought and ideas, then uh, who knows where we'd be today. Uh, if we had stayed as group homes, I don't even think we'd be in existence right the fact. I know a lot of people who were working then would no longer be here. I mean, the idea of what, uh, what we had and what we were doing back then and where we wanted to go was so important to us that we had to have that sort of positive and uh, free-spirited and optimistic attitude to get where we wanted to go. But you know, 
even with that sort of optimism. And when we finally did move out of sort of that group homes, one of the one of the, the most important benefits of that, significant benefits of that, not second to what how people's lives changed and the personalized service of the people who provided services to. And I think the the fact that their lives had changed really happened because we when we were running group homes, we were so consumed by staff issues that we spent so much time dealing with staff and working on the issues of staff that we really had less and less time about talking and thinking and uh, caring for the people uh, that we were supposed to. And once we moved through that door into shared living, then there was a dramatic shift and we it freed us up to think and to care about people we provided services to. And it became less and less, we used to, I mean, if, if you were a manager in a group home and you carried a beeper, you were getting called three, four, or five times a week, at least. And then, once we moved to shared living, you're getting, and it was all staff issues, it wasn't, and then rarely did it have anything to do with somebody who lived in the group home, but it had to do with staff not being around, staff asking, you know, those types of questions that uh, make no sense, but, uh, when we move through that. But what I've seen, even with this sort of this optimism, in the last three or four years, we've begun to shift back to the issues around staff. And the time that's spent at particular levels is because of the issues that are going on among staff. From the Berkshires to the Cape, we're hearing stories of people that feel like they're getting bullied. We're, we're hearing stories of people that feel like uh, other people are being racist to them. We're hearing stories of, you know, people arguing uh, with each other on site, you know, in front of people, in front of shared living providers, in front of people who provide services to them. We're hearing about all these things that really get in the way of us providing, you know, quality types of services. And, I'm, and my optimism is, is waning because for the last three or four years, although not in a really coordinated, in a, in finally a coordinated, the, the organization has made it a real priority of around how we treat one another here. You know, we've been really good, and I've said this before, we've been really, really, really good when we talk about how we should serve people, how we should treat people that we provide services to. And I think we're amazing about that. But at, at the expense of making sure that that trans positions itself to how we treat each other here in the organization. And we began talking about it, and it became, and people know this story, became acutely aware to me about that um, after my crash, well, just before the crash I was in, but particularly after uh, the crash. And um, people may not know, but I think most people know that I was in a major league car accident on my way up to Pittsfield. Um, on Route 9 Cummington and uh, a car crossed the, the center line and you know, we were each going about 60 miles an hour and um, I'm lucky to be alive, I thank God that I'm alive and, um, and I was uh, immobilized, I was in ICU for a week, I was in rehab for a month, I was in a wheelchair for 30 days and I saw what it meant, even though it was for a short time, I got a snapshot a real snapshot of what it meant to be disabled. And I saw how beautiful and loving people can be when, you know, I had, I was completely humble. Uh, people had to feed me, people had to dress me, people had to wash me, people had to change me. Uh, I was 100% relying on other people. And this was for a short period, I can't, and as much as I understood what that meant for me, it was even harder for me to, to think about what that must mean to be in the body of somebody whose life is like that, and how much they really depend on other people. And I saw the beauty of some of these people who, who, who without any judgments, took care of me. You know, Non-judgmental, took care of me, uh, they were beautiful, wonderful, 
wonderful people, but I also saw people who loved to humil humiliate me, who loved to take advantage of my weakness, who loved to take advantage of, uh, of my dependence, uh, to make me feel less than human. Um, and so coming back, the whole idea of how we treat each other became more and more acutely important to me and to, the, and I, and to this organization. And I think that and I came back believe, quite frankly believing that we hadn't done a good enough job about how we relate to each other as, as co-workers, as colleagues. Um, and so we began and I began to make an effort. I made a statement and the first time back I talked about um, how um, people treated me and uh, how wonderful people were and how not so wonderful people were and how, how important it was for us as an organization to bend over backwards to make sure that we looked and we were open enough to the humanness of all of us. Uh, as, because if we can't, if we can't treat our, each other, our colleagues, well, how, do we, how can we expect that you're going to be treated people that we provide services with? How can we expect that you're going to extend yourself to families? And so we began this initiative around civility. And it took a long time. We, we talked about it here. We talked about it there. Uh, but finally, with really the help of a, a, a group of people, and in particular, uh, Adam and Shana, uh, we've come up with this, with this training around civility, which um, is really, really important. And I want to say that even though there's been um, sort of uh, a knife that's started to uh, chip away at sort of my optimism here, I'm not going to allow it to get much further because, because I think this training and our sort of initiative and our efforts to really push the idea of us being civil to one another is going to make us sort of turn that corner. It's really, really important that we all understand that it's our responsibility, individual responsibility lays on all of you. And if you're not part of that solution, if you're not challenging the instability of people, then you're part of the problem. Then you're accepting something that this agency will not accept. People may not even be aware of the way that they they're acting towards you, or you're acting towards somebody. You have to make people aware of that. You have to step up and say, and, and Shana will talk about ways that we can do it, how we can sort of talk about, to people about uh, how they're responding. We've already begun uh, from me, and it's going to be spreading down through uh, John and Rich um, and others, uh, and Kitty, a way that um, we're going to be talking at every supervision meeting about are people treating you well? Am I treating you well? Are you treating other people well? And we're going to be asking around to say whether or not that's true. Because being rotten to other people is unacceptable. Being grumpy to other people is unacceptable. Okay? We're not going to... If, you can't take the spirit, if you can't understand what we do here. I mean, we are so incredibly fortunate to have, first of all, we should be humbled by our work here because of what we do. I mean, if you can't understand and be humbled and really be, feel how fortunate we are to work in a field that we do, to serve the people that we do, the people in the families that we do, to work for what I believe is an incredible organization then maybe you don't belong here. Maybe this is not the fit for you. We want the best, the most positive people working here. So, to put myself, and I hope everybody else has a better frame of mind, uh, <laughs> I'm going to sort of end this part by saying, uh, just reading um, three different quotes. And the first one is, uh, Wherever there is a human being, there is an opportunity for kindness. Second one is, love is patient and kind. Love is not just jealous or boastful. It's not arrogant or rude. 
And that's something to really sort of consider here. I mean, if we can bring sort of a certain humility to our jobs here, that we're not, we take away sort of a certain bravado, you know, that we may, uh, we may have. And we are humbled by the enormity and the importance of what we do here, then I think that's what sort of the trap and the road that this agency wants us to follow. And then finally, this is so true, to be fully human, we must be able to, manage, to imagine others hurt and relate to it, to relate to the pain we would experience if we were in their place. Now that's more than just stepping in somebody's shoes. That's really stepping into somebody's life. That's her. And how would I be? What would that pain feel like for me if I were in that place? So before I hand it over to uh, Shauna, I just want to start by sort of asking the question, uh, what is civility? And civility means many things to many people, but I think that we all understand uh, in, in a sense or in essence what it is. But for me, um, I'm just going to offer this. Civility is just, in many ways, just the simplicity of saying please and thank you, or lowering your voice, or acknowledging a newcomer into a conversation, opening the door for somebody, welcoming a new neighbor, respecting, really, truly respecting those that are different from us. Letting a car get in line. I mean, it's an interesting sort of concept, but down on the Cape, if you're trying to make a left-hand turn, cars stop and let you go through. It's, it's like a new world. Acknowledging our mistakes, and that's another really important thing, is that uh, if we make a mistake, acknowledge it. Refusing to participate in gossip, gossip. Giving up our seat on a bus. Being patient. Giving directions to people who seem lost. Saying good morning and good evening. And really asking people how they're doing. And being 